Hello everyone, and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week. I'm your host, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting Monday, September 3rd, 2012. This week's episode is going to cover some Java exploit updates, some big hacktivist breaches, uh, Microsoft's upcoming patch day, and also a new security tool out there that's great for security practitioners. Let's start with the updates to the big Java exploit that was spreading last week. If you remember in last week's episode, I talked about a zero-day Java vulnerability that many attackers were leveraging in the wild. This vulnerability has been built into many of the web exploit frameworks out there, like the Black Hole Toolkit. Uh, Metasploit has a, a, a uh, exploit for it, and many attackers have web pages in the wild that actually exploit this vulnerability. Now, of course, Oracle patched this vulnerability last week. So if you've installed that patch on Windows machines, you're probably safe. This week, there's two new updates to this big Java incident. Uh, first of all, shortly after Oracle released their patch, a Polish security research team called Security Explorations claimed that the new update had a new security vulnerability, specifically a Java sandbox bypass vulnerability that allows other Java bugs to get past the typical sandbox that Java usually uses to restrict Java applications. Security Explorations had found on many other Java vulnerabilities that weren't really exploitable because of Java's sandbox. But this new Java sandbox bypass vulnerability allows all those other bugs to become exploitable. Now the good news is Security Explorations hasn't released any details on all these uh, bypass vulnerabilities. They've told Oracle about them, but they're not going to share them with the world until Oracle patches. So unlike the Java exploit that was found in the wild last week, attackers aren't yet exploiting this particular vulnerability. Nonetheless, it's further proof that Java is pretty dangerous. If you can get away with turning off Java or not using it on your computer, you should do so. Uh, that said, many sites do rely on Java, so you may have to use it. The second update to the Java incident comes from Apple. Apple actually includes Java in OS X. Specifically, uh, Mountain Lion, Lion, and Snow Leopard ship with Java version 1.6. This week, Apple released a, a OS X update to fix some of the Java vulnerabilities in their version of Java. Now, the big vulnerability that everyone's talking about, I believe it's CVE 2012-4681, that's the one people are exploiting in the wild. That only affects Java version 1.7. So that big vulnerability actually didn't affect OS X. However, when Oracle released their emergency update, there were two other serious Java flaws as well, and Apple's update fixes those flaws. So if you're an Apple administrator or user, you should definitely let uh, Apple's automatic update uh, install this update on OS X. To finish off this story, I just want to let any WatchGuard users out there know that our security appliances, our XTM appliances, actually can protect against this Java exploit. Our gateway antivirus service, which comes from AVG and Kaspersky, depending on your appliance, has signatures for many of these exploits, and our IPS service actually has signatures as well. Uh, our IPS service last week could catch the Metasploit exploit, but this week we actually released uh, six more signatures related to the CVE 2012-4681 vulnerability. So if you have a WatchGuard XTM appliance and you have IPS and gateway antivirus, you are well protected. Nonetheless, you should still patch. Next, let's talk about this week's hacktivist breaches. There's actually three I want to talk about, one big one and two I'll just mention in passing. The big one came out early this week when a group called Antisec released details about how they stole the UDID numbers of many iPhones. UDID stands for Unique Device Identifier, and it's basically a unique number that every single iPhone has. 
Well, anyways, Antiset claimed that they stole a file containing over 12 million UDID numbers for iPhones from an FBI computer. They basically said they gained access to a laptop computer used by a particular FBI agent, and on the computer was an Excel file containing all these UDID numbers, as well as also uh, email addresses, uh, cell phone numbers, and a few other p bits of personal information related to these UDID numbers. Uh, to prove this particular hack, they released a paste bin file that contained a million and one of the UDID numbers. And uh, various people actually were able to find that their UDID number was on the list. So it is confirmed that the anti-set group really did gain access to at least a million and one UDID numbers. Later in the week, however, the FBI did deny that they were the source of this breach. They said that they don't have these UDID numbers and Antisec is lying about where they got them. So we'll see how this story develops in the future. But what does this really mean to you? What are, what are issues with this? Well, first of all, if your UDID number is on this list of breach numbers, some of your personal information is out there. A lot of applications, a lot of social network applications and other things on iPhones sometimes use UDID numbers for authentication and stuff like that. So uh, theoretically, if a hacker had your UDID number and he knew you used a particular social networking application on your iPhone, he may be able to use that to authenticate his use. So there's that potential danger. If it is true attackers got these uh, numbers from an FBI computer, you might want to ask yourself, why does the FBI have 12 million UDID uh, numbers for iPhone devices? So this is a very interesting story. We'll continue to follow it and, and let you know of any updates if they come out. I'll mention two more hacktivist breaches just very, very quickly. One was a group calling themselves the Null Crew was able to actually breach one of Sony's mobile sites. I believe it was one of their Chinese mobile sites. And Sony did later confirm that they were able to steal the personal information of a number of Chinese people that use this particular Sony mobile site. Also in more rumored hacktivist group, an uh, unnamed group posted to Pastebin a claim that they'd gain access to Mitt Romney's tax information, his tax filing for 2010. According to the Pastebin post, this hacktivist group uh, claims to have breached Bryce Waterhouse Cooper's uh, network and somehow gain access to Mitt Romney's uh, tax filings for 2010. They apparently also dropped off a manila folder to one of the Democratic Party's meeting places, which contained a four gigabyte uh, a flash drive as well as a, a printout of a letter that included a picture of Mitt Romney's signature. Now, no one's confirmed this breach really happened. In fact, uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper says that they weren't breached. There's no evidence of a breach. And the Democratic Party has kind of assumed that this is some sort of uh, fake. So in either case, we'll, we'll keep track of this story as well to see if it does become true and let you know more about it in the future. Next, let's talk about Microsoft Patch Day. On Thursday, Microsoft posted their normal advanced notification post. And the good news for Microsoft administrators is they only plan on releasing two security bulletins this month. And both are actually minor bulletins. One affects some of the Microsoft development platforms like Visual Studio. And another one affects a somewhat obscure Microsoft server package. And both of these bulletins are rated important rather than critical. So it's not really going to be a huge patch day. However, in another trustworthy computing blog post, a Microsoft employee did talk about an upcoming patch day in October that will be important. In a previous security uh, advisory, Microsoft talked about how they're going to change their certificate handling for Windows operating systems. Their PKI infrastructure is only going to support certificates with 1,024-bit uh, keys. So if you're currently using any certificates that don't have 1,024-bit keys, when they force this update to Windows in October, those certificates won't work. So your takeaway is, if you use certificates in your network, you need to make sure that you're using uh, certificates with 1,024-bit uh, keys. If you're not, come October, you might need to use some of Microsoft's patch management software to block that particular update until you update your certificates. So again, to summarize, uh, this month's patch day is going to be very, very light. But pay attention to the patch day in October and make sure your certificates are up to snuff. 
I'll finish this episode by quickly mentioning a new security tool I just learned about. A few years ago, a researcher named Joanna Rutiskaya of Invisible Things uh, released a virtualization exploit called Blue Pill. Without going into a ton of detail, it was essentially a rootkit for virtual, uh, virtual hardware that allowed her to basically gain access to your virtual hypervisor so that she could lie to everything your virtual machines were doing. Anyways, this week she released a new tool with her company called Cubes. Cubes is essentially a sandboxing operating system. It's an operating system based on a Zen hypervisor that allows you to create different security domains as you're running software. Uh, basically, you can create a work security domain, a play security domain, and a personal security domain, and run applications within those specific uh, security domains sandboxed from everything else in your operating system. Now, I've actually downloaded the ISO for this. It's publicly available, and I'll put a link of where you can find it in the WatchGuard Security Center post for this episode. I can't say whether or not I recommend it yet, because I haven't used it enough yet. Nonetheless, if you're a security professional uh, interested in experimenting and uh, learning how you can improve your security in everyday computing usage, I recommend you check out Cubes and give it a try. I'll certainly let you know what I think of it in uh, a future episode to come. Well, that covers yet another week in network security. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And be sure to return next week when we cover Microsoft's Patch uh, Tuesday in detail, as well as share any other security stories that crop up over the week. As usual, if you'd like more regular updates, be sure to check out WatchGuardSecurityCenter.com. And you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept. Thank you for watching. And here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you. Yeah.